This is an oral history with Wes McKinley. Um, Wes was a member of the uh, grand jury, in fact he was the foreman of the grand jury that investigated Rocky Flats, and we'll be talking about that today. Um, this is an oral history for the Maria Rogers Oral History Project of the Carnegie Library, and uh, I am Dorothy Charlo, and the date today is March 25th, 2004. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, thanks for having me here. Yeah. And um, the first question is, when and where were you born? I was born March the 5th in 1945, uh -huh. right at the end of World War II. Uh -huh. And uh, my folks were living on my granddad's old homestead. Yeah. Granddad McKinley came up from Texas and homesteaded in extreme southeast corner of Colorado about 1907. And he lived there for a few years. He came with a good milk cow, and a fine mule, and an old wagon, and then God blessed him with a good woman right after he got there. And uh, he didn't bring her. No, he didn't. Most of the women in that area came as school teachers, and my grandmother came with her cousin, and they taught school. There was a school every ten miles or so. There was a school set there because the, all this land was homesteaded in 320 acre plots. You could get that given to you under conditions that you develop it and stay there, develop, make a little farm and ranch. Granddad had came with one of his brothers. Granddad McKinley was one of six brothers. And they had uh, settled there and homesteaded in Oklahoma, one of them, and then Granddad and his brother came into Colorado. A couple of ladies come in and that become my grandmother, my aunt. And then my mother, her folks came in at about the turn of the century over just across the line in Kansas. Now remember, we're only 12 miles from the Kansas border where Granddad homesteaded. And I still live on that same piece of property today. Still have it. But I was born in 45, 1945 in Elkhart, Kansas, which was the closest town. It's ironic that uh, right now, I'm, of course, in Colorado, I always have been, but the closest town of any size is Amarillo, Texas. So I actually live 142 miles north of Amarillo, Texas, 200 miles southeast of Pueblo. It's right there in the corner. I started school at Mitchell School, six years old. It was a one-room country school. And the running water we had was the water that we ran out to the windmill and got every day. We would go out every day and fill a bucket up. The little ranch lady was our teacher, 12 grades represented in a sod schoolhouse, no electricity. And the heat was an old coal stove, and we had to run outside to the bathroom. The boys went to the south, the girls to the northwest. And that was our bathrooms, and we started formal education. Went eight years to a one-room country school with all eight grades in there, and then graduated. I have an eighth-grade diploma, Dorothy. Not everybody has an eighth-grade diploma, but I do have an eighth-grade diploma. And went to high school in Walsh. Walsh was the closest place to go. It was only high school by that time. The schools had started consolidating in the 50s. So I went to high school in Walsh, met a lovely woman, lady, girl there at that time, and we got married, and we're still married. Eight kids. We have eight kids, and that's so far. But Jan wants to uh, save all the children of the world, and we're adopting. We've adopted kids. We have five adopted and three natural born, and, of course, several grandkids. And Jan now is working on starting a therapeutic or a specialized group home. She wants to, to do a group home, get into that. But then after uh, high school, went to college, and I never did like to work too hard, and I noticed a lot of my buddies got out and got good jobs, but they was working and making lots of money, and I didn't like to work, and it seemed like I was just happy with whatever I had, so I went to college, got a degree in mathematics and physics, minor in physics, and taught school for then a few years. In, in the same area? Yes, in the same area. I taught school in Pritchett and Springfield, Clayton, New Mexico. And see, we're only 84 miles from Clayton, New Mexico. Within an hour, I can cover, I believe it's five states. There's New Mexico, Texas. See, we're only about 40 miles from Texas, Oklahoma, and uh, Kansas, and of course, live in Colorado. So I'm within an hour of touching five states. And you can start in about an hour and a half, actually drive in each one of those states and be back home. And so it's pretty undynamic. You know, there's nothing really exciting about that. You do ranching and farming? 
Yeah, ranching. I do some ranching now, and I take people out into Comanche National Grassland. I have a special usage permit. We go out on week-long trail rides and wagon train trips. And my partner, Dean Ormiston, and I, we've been doing that for about 15 years. Well, it's Kirkwell Cattle Company. I think we, it's longer now. We actually started that in about 87. So we're uh, 20, what, 27 years, or 17 years into that. So we've been doing that quite a while. So that's the way you support yourself, basically? Or well, my wife's a school teacher. If, uh, and one thing, and I did a little cowboy portrait, if you were going to be a cowboy, Dorothy, you really need a wife with a good paycheck because that really helps. It's kind of difficult to be a cowboy without some uh, supplementation or support from somewhere. Then in 89, August of 89, I received this notice in the mail. And it looked like one of those computerized, computer-generated cards that you get in the mail saying you've won a great prize. Call this number with your credit card handy and we'll, you know, you're the first one to win this million dollar prize. I actually thought about throwing it away. <laughs> I didn't realize it didn't look all that official. But I did go to town to a guy I knew that was lots more knowledgeable. I said, well, can you tell me what this is? He looked at it and said, sure. You've been summoned to serve on a grand jury. And I didn't really know what that meant. I thought that a grand jurist was learned legal scholars that sat both to the right and left of the judge and ponder great legal decisions. But I found that's not true. I don't know why I didn't know this earlier. But it's a pure protection. Do you know how grand juries actually got started? No. Well, in medieval times, in the days of the knights, the knights were sitting around doing what men do. They was drinking beer and talking about horses ridden and races won, wars fought, loves lost. And one of them said, and then, of course, as you do that, you talk about the, the ones that are no longer there with you. Do you remember? You get into the remembered stage. And yes, they, they remembered old Sir Knight Edwards. And the king had cut his head off for some infraction. And the, he now, the king now had Sir Edward's beautiful wife as his own. And someone else had a wonderful set of chargers, big, beautiful white horses. And the king didn't like him, so he charged him with the crime and hung him. And he now had the horses. So these knights got to thinking, you know, but the fact that my wife's not a good cook and hard to live with and my horses are so old and sway back, there I could go. So, and, and this is kind of the way it actually happened. So the knights all got together, and it's simple, and said, let's go to the king. Let's, all of us get together. And let's go to king and say, king, old buddy, we're not going to go for this anymore. You can't just go out here and start charging everybody, whoever, with a crime unless a group of noblemen say it's okay. Then, for our protection, part of the rules that we're going to draw up and present is that uh, the king can't find out what we said inside the room with regards to testimony, and he can't find out how we voted because if we don't vote the way he wants to, he'll come and behead us, so that's, that's part we're not going to let him find that out. So they went to him and said, you know, we don't have any choice. We don't want a big war over this, but here's the deal. And the king said, well, okay. So the grand jury was instigated. It, it was formed. And it remained. It wasn't part of our Constitution. It was adopted into it. It says, I forget which amendment, that no one shall be charged with a crime unless, without presentation of the grand jury. You know, you couldn't indict unless the grand jury said indict. So we have it, and it's removed and separated. It's a tribunal body, it's a legal body, not under the direction of the court. And the grand jury rules that we had, the judge is charged to it, says you must maintain your independence. And it says you must do as you feel is right without fear or favor of the courts, the prosecutors, or the public. So it, it was a, a conscience of the people. And it was randomly selected. A grand jury is randomly selected. Now, a trial jury is a biased jury. See, if you're charged, let's say, with drunk driving, then your attorney is going to go down, and he, if he can, he's going to get all your drinking buddies on the jury. And the prosecution is going to go down and get all the temperance people on his jury. Well, somewhere in the middle you're going to meet, and it's a real art form, stacking these juries. There's a specialist that devise the questions, and they stack this jury. And so juries are usually tried to stack. Grand jury is random selecting. You just start drawing names 
I they can't eliminate people. The prosecutors or the there, no, there's no elimination. Now you can eliminate yourself. And I was told in my case that I could probably get off because it was a hardship. I could plead hardship. And it was 300 miles to the courthouse, 303 miles actually to the courthouse. And I had a ranch to run, and so, you know, you could plead. And it, then. What made you decide not to plead that? I was going to. I went to the meeting, planning on getting off. And there's actually notices sent out to about 50-some people, 52 or 3, I'm not sure exactly. And whenever they, they get you in a room and then they ex explain a little about grand jury, and <clears throat> then they draw at, or they go through the uh, roll call. And in our case, there was two or three people weren't there, which is a chargeable offense. They could have sent the marshal out after you, or you know you could be charged. But it's seldom done because the person may not have received it, they could have died, you know, just two or three, so it was nothing done. And then they ask who wanted to be left off or excused. Well, I think we actually did outside the judge's chamber, but anyway, we're, we're outside, and they go through the little preview about the grand jury, and they do the roll, roll call. Then we go into the judge's chambers, and it's explained a little further about this is a case against Rockwell International that operates the Department of Energy bomb manufacturing facility and in violation of uh, or, um, allegations of environmental crimes committed and the case had been put together by FBI agent, we found out later, John Lipsky. Two-year investigation, then they had done the raid. After the investigation, they had obtained a search warrant and they did the raid and the grand jury, special grand jury, was formed. This was the first ever special grand jury. Now the only thing special or different about a special, a uh, regular, is that a special grand jury is impaneled to hear one case. But typically grand juries, see now you can't go out and charge anybody with a capital crime unless they are presented by a grand jury or the grand jury votes the indictment. So uh, just like, well you have a big case here in Colorado, the Kobe Bryant case. See, they're going to take that before a grand I think he's already been indicted, Andy. I think so. Yeah. Uh, they, they couldn't have charged him with this unless the grand jury said okay. Well, we, all 50 of us go into the, the judge's chambers, and then the judge tells us again about the case, and we get a lot more detail, the U.S. attorney, and the judge wants to know who would like to be excused. Well, by that time, I'd heard about it, and it was an engineering case, and I'm interested in that. It sounded like it would be interesting, very interested in scientific stuff. So I decided, well, I'm not going to plead out. Then they start drawing the names, and I, they, they draw them, and it was um, very interesting, my feelings. I say, Phew. boy, I'm glad that's not me. Sure glad they didn't get mine. About three or four, I said, when are you going to call my name? You know, <laughs> I'm kind of wanting to do this. <laughs> and then two or three, I thought, well, that's, that's okay. I'm glad I didn't get well, about 12, 13, I was on down the line, about midway. It's amazing, about, the, about where my name appears in the alphabet is where my name was drawn. And this was, did you ever go to the movies on Wednesday night back in the 50s, whenever we had the bank night, the movies, and you could, there was a prize draw? It was actually a drum with numbers, and they drawed that number out, and that was, if that was your number, you were on. First 23, and there was some people in there said they they asked if you'd ever worked at Rocky Flats or been related, and uh, there was they a could have ruled out those people. sure, and the the judge could have said, well, you know, you've you worked there, you have too much spatial interest. Uh, one guy had uh, had done something with regards to that, and I told him that I had done some work with the uh, Department of Health in Colorado. I'd done some permitting on oil and gas wells. I'd done a little oil and gas work. So I'd permitted that, but you know, I was, then there's just two or three things I can. It's totally irrelevant. It's just it's not reason enough unless you want off, and so we'll do a civic duty. Well, I was selected about the place in the roll call is where my name appears in the alphabet about midway through, and I wasn't the foreman, and I forgot how that was selected. I believe, and the judge, I think, just asked the first name out whenever we got through, and he drawed to 23. That was the grand jury. Then 24, 25, 26, 27, they drawed all the way down to the bottom. And those were the alternates. And we had... Four alternates. Pardon? Four alternates. No. Oh, all, all the rest. All the rest was the alternates in, or, in that order. And we hadn't met too many times, four or five times, and the foreman, which I believe 
maybe it's only once we met the the foreman he asked to be dismissed and so then they brought another alternate on and the next guy appointed as foreman the, and the judge appointed him and he uh, lasted several sessions three or four months but then he moved he left the state or something he didn't be foreman and so then I got to be foreman by default but that did the judge appoint the foreman based on leadership qualities no or? no he just random I think the first guy drawn he selected him and the next day guy drawn was probably the next guy selected but by the time they we had been there three or four months you know, this time and I was always the first one in there and I got the coffee ready. I figured if I'm going to be in Denver, we just as well go down and get started on time. Dorothy, I had the hardest time with that. Attorneys must study how to be late <laughs> because they had a terrible time getting there. And about the second meeting or something, we had the guy said, well, let's do a little house cleaning. Let's talk about some of the, you know, anything you want to talk about. I was the first one to raise his man. I said, you know, if we're going to start at 9 o'clock, let's be here at 9 o'clock. If you want to start at 9.15, let's start at 9.15. I said, personally, I'd like to start about 7. You know, 6.30 would be a good time, or 6, and we could start. But, of course, that was unfeasible. But they agreed, all right, we'll start at 9. That never did happen, but, you know, we kept hammering on I was did the you first one. anything? Oh, it was a good job. The first one there, and I knew more. I was, I didn't know more, but I was able to understand the testimony. And there's a lot of scientific terms. It wasn't real complicated, but the testing procedures and the engineering terms, water flows, volumes, and just the different things, conversions from uh, metric to English, that was all my area. I had taught math and science for several years. So I was kind of at the front as knowing the technical aspect. And everyone in there had their own unique abilities. You know, it wasn't that there was anybody better, or stronger, or anything. So, uh, since I was probably doing more inside the grand jury room than the others at that time, because of, at that time it was just technical, the uh, secretary came and said, well, the other foreman went off and, you know, we'd heard you. And, and the prosecutors, I was fine with them because I could ask questions in such a manner that the other grand jurors, and, you know, it had to be simple for me to understand it, so we kept it simple. So I just got to be foreman. I'm not sure exactly the process. It wasn't anything unique. So I was the foreman then. And we would come into this grand jury room, and that's, uh, that's what our book is about, is a cover-up. Because I went through, and I was impressed, our civic duty, tribunal body, removed, not under the direction, but equal to the courts and those, and we started meeting from that point on. Very first witness was John Lipsky, and he was a very fine fellow. And then the next witness was Jackie Brevers. And... We heard the testimony. And the, the point of the case was, the main thing was they had illegally operated this incinerator. And we now, had, Was that the major first charge? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, was that what precipitated the FBI raid? I think it was just all the stories and environment. And we were thinking more about the environment back then, and everybody was kind of getting onto it. And I like this protected environment. You know, this, this wall switch here is not the environment. We think it is. It gets too hot, turn the thermos up, turn it down, turn the lights up or down, you know, little slide switches so that we can adjust it. That's not the environment. I mean, it all comes from outside, and we're going to leave here. We can uh, pollute this building. We can make such a mess we can leave, but we're not leaving the planet. We're going to stay here, and we need to take care of it. And as farmers and ranchers, I, you know, we are the environmentalists. That's how we survive. And I, I love living outside, you know. I wouldn't go in the house if I had my way about it. But we're protective and like that. And farmers have done some terrible things. We like to destroy our area in the 30s with the farming practices. You've seen the stories, maybe lived through it in the 50s. But we learned. And as soon as we learn how to do something better, we start doing it better. Because we do want to save it. Well, that's what this is about. And, and that's one reason it interested you. Yes, it is. Very interested in it. And in the 50s, Rocky Flats came into being in 52. We were building the bomb. And I've had a little bit of uh, discussion with some of my very close friends about this because I kind of like the bomb. We are the super country on the planet because we got the biggest weapon. I mean, if, if we didn't have the biggest bomb, we wouldn't be here. But now what point do you defend yourself? Now your house, you could put a lock on the door, 
Put a fence around it. Put a security system inside it. Get your Doberman Pinscher inside. Now we're talking security. Protect yourself. And uh, then you could get a club. You could get you a pistol. You could get a shotgun. Well, then where are you going to go? Are you going to put you a tank outside? Going to get you a nuclear submarine to set out there? Get you a jet fighter? You know, once you get past the shotgun and the club, there's just not a whole lot you can do beyond that. So you can envision these two super countries, maybe, well, two countries. And one of them gets mad at the other one and says, look, you know, I am really mad. And all I got to do is punch the button and you're gone. And the next guy says, well, all I got to do is punch the button and you're gone too. The first guy says, well, all I got to do is punch this button and the whole world's gone. The next guy said, well, go ahead and blow the world up. I'm going to blow it up twice. So here you're arguing about who's going to blow the world up the most times. I mean, we, we come to that point. And the engineers at Rocky Flats, not in testimony, but later, told me we didn't need to do it. Jim Kelly, which was a fierce defender of the jobs at Rocky Flats, in his obituary last week, he has quoted him as saying, you know, the sad thing about it was we didn't need to pollute like that. The, the rabbits were hot, the mosquitoes, you get a mosquito bite, you were polluted. And uh, one of the engineers told me, Ray Geyer actually, told me that, do you know Ray? No, I don't. Fine fellow. He never testified before the grand jury, and I haven't heard from him. He had health problems, 52 or 3 year old, 55, had terrible health problems at that time. And he said there was a process involved where we re, uh, the bombs would come in, old bombs would come in, and they needed to. The guidance systems would be updated. We would learn better avionics, better ways of guidance, and some of that stuff would deteriorate. They would, just like your car, you need to go in and maintain it. But <clears throat> every time you take your car in for an oil change, you don't throw the motor away. Well, they would take these bombs in for maintenance, and they took out the nuclear trigger, the four pounds of plutonium, and then Ray told me, literally throwed it away. Now, it only lasts 24,000 years. And he said, why are we doing that? And he said, here's a procedure we can use. And we will update, keep these updated. And we don't have to throw this stuff away. We'll scatter this stuff around. So they did it. And it worked for a short time. And then they went back to the old way. And he said, why are we doing that? I said, it's not you to ask why. It is you to do the work. So they did it. Well, it made money. There's a cost plus performance, and then you make money every time you use a new plutonium. So we just manufacture plutonium in the guise of money. As individuals, each and every one of us, we have a heart and soul. But when we all form together and become a corporation comprised of hearts and souls, then it ceases to exist. Somehow they cancel out, and it's replaced by the profit, profit on the stock. And that's what we had. It was a money-generating thing. So we met for two and a half years. Heard testimony. Jackie, the FBI agent, John Lipsky, numerous other people. And the FBI... And many other people. Yes, I, and in the book there, I think it quotes 185 witnesses. And a million pages of documents. That's, that's all in our book. I'm not sure exactly what. All of that is very interesting that uh, not much... Just after our investigation had gotten started, here we were thinking we were pretty important. Uh, it was up to us to decide. Evidence was being brought in by the top experts, and we were going to weigh this evidence, very serious about it. We read in the papers that a couple of local politicians, the governor and the congressman from this area, had done their investigation and concluded no violations in the papers. Now, how in the world can we be impaneled with the highest experts and they've already got the investigation concluded? I was pretty happy about that. I thought, wow, this is going to be a short case. We can go home. You know, it's over. So you had just started. Yes, yeah, started. We had three I or four, when five. That was said, but yes. I thought they were basing it on, on what you all had learned. But we just started learning stuff. Yes, and then we have the FBI expert. We've had a few witnesses, some come in. So Al Divers, Alan Divers, they bring him in, and he talks about the infrared flyover. And the next day in the newspapers, FBI expert shot down. Grand jury discredits him. How'd they know that? And Could, Can you tell for people who might be 
uh, not know what the flyover was. Can you tell a little bit? Yes, about that? there was uh, an incinerator at Rocky Flats, building 771. And they took trash and burned it. It was a huge incinerator, I forget how many feet tall. And they took trash out there. It had liquid oxygen piped into it. It's kind of an interesting procedure. You just went up to this oven thing and held your paper, piece of paper, a piece of tissue, and a cigarette lighter down there and lit it. And then you started pumping in the gas and the oxygen and you throwed in trash. And it burnt. And it, would, it took a lot of heat to get it up there. And once it was at the heat, the right temperature, then you just kept it burning. And it would burn, do what they called a burn for two or three weeks at a time, 24 hours a day. These people would be in there shoveling in material. So, now, so the FBI then, and that was, uh, it had been ordered shut down. That was in violation of the environmental law. So that was one of the keys to this investigation. Because uh, there was radioactive material in there? Yes. It was mixed waste? Yes, this was radioactive material. It was below economic recovery level. So, uh, and uh, Jackie knows a lot more, you know. I'm getting kind of area out of my, but that's essentially what it was, that they uh, charged that this incinerator had been burning. Now, as part of that charge, they did flyovers with an airplane, an infrared camera, and they took pictures of that. The FBI did. Yes, the FBI took the pictures. And then that was what was used as evidence. The, the FBI expert come in and testified about that. And then in the papers, in the newspapers. There's only so many places this information come from. There was 23 members of the grand jury and then the prosecutors. Now, nobody else. The court reporter there is typing that, and of course that's record, but that's all supposed to be sealed. But any one of those people inside it, hardly ever did we actually have 23. Now you needed a quorum, you needed 16 people. That was a quorum. So if you had 16, you could conduct grand jury business, and 16 up to 23. And the alternates, we I talked earlier about that, we actually got down to about seven or eight alternates. People would request to get off for you know, illness. And it was easy to get excused. All you had to do was to come and check with the foreman and say, you know, I would like to be off. And that way you could make sure you had a quorum. And you could say yes and no. And I always excused if I uh, could. And <clears throat> so uh, the, then the FBI expert was shot down. And I didn't know that. But see, none of that could be said. But that was the reason. That was being published in the paper. Yes. And you still don't know who, no. who talked. Is that right? I suspect the Justice Department did because that was part of their case. See, they were discrediting us from the start. I didn't know that then. But I think they were. You're sure that it wasn't any of the. I'm sure. Jury. I'm sure. And then. Because when we did the book and we Karen got a hold of Al Divers, I'll hold this book hold up. Book. When, when Karen got a hold of Al Divers, you can read Al Divers' testimony. He told Karen, I'm not, I can't tell you what he said in the grand jury room. That's a violation of Rule 6E. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Al Divers told Karen, I did not change my testimony. He was amazed. You know, he couldn't believe it. He said, what? They said I changed my testimony? The Justice Department said that? She said, well, here's a newspaper article. And here's their testimony before Congress. Al Divers changed his testimony. No. This guy said no. They lied about it. Well, that's part of what's in here. Now, he was the one who actually, uh, he didn't do the flyover, but he no. studied the material. He analyzed, yeah. He was, he was the film expert that uh, looked at, you know, they would just actually send about anybody to operate a camera. But the camera operator is not the guy that reads the x-ray. It's kind of like an x-ray. You know, the, the technician that takes the, the picture is not the one that really looks at it and tells you what, what there's there. And, and I presume, just to go back a moment, but I presume that the FBI had done the flyovers because they already were suspicious that yes. there was illegal mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Right. They were suspicious of the illegal burnings. There was a lot of things. They were gathering evidence from a lot of different bodies. sources. Yes. And that was a visual that you could see and pretty easy to prove. So we thought we were concentrating on that. And then all of a sudden, Al Divers changed his testimony, which he says he didn't change. And then when we put it together, went to investigate it, see the chronological order of the way things happened, it becomes clear, because just spaced out, you know, you miss part of that. But when you put it together, it was an investigation, a seven-year investigation to do the book. And 
It was interesting how that happened. I would uh, go through, and it was several years before I met Karen. And <clears throat> the one guy asked me, he said, well, you just did nothing since 92 to uh, four years, I guess, 96. Then you kind of got started and got active in 97. So here's a five years that you just didn't do anything. Why did you just not do anything? Well, that's not true because as soon as it was over, I handed my findings in to the judge. And I thought, well, now that's, that's good. I, my, my part's done. I've done my civic duty and whatever happens. And, and the grand jury met from 89 to 92. So yes, right? yes. And uh, to uh, cover your deal about wages, we were paid a decent wage. $40 a day, well, that's not so much, but we were paid $100 a day living expense, and then we paid $7 a day parking and 20 to 25 cents a mile. And it didn't make a difference whether you parked, and I asked about that because I rode the bus up. I could buy a bus ticket for $50 and get paid, what, $130 for the trip. And I said, you know, I cost, it only cost me 50 bucks. And you know, here I'm getting paid. I can get paid 120. I said, that made a difference. This is the schedule. You know, if you charter your own airplane, we're still just going to pay you this much. Or if you walk, I said, okay. And I don't have parking. I said, you're allowed seven bucks parking. And so I, I made a little off of that. And it wasn't a hardship. And I, it was kind of, it was difficult being away from home for a week, but it was, we all do things. I mean, it's not a sacrifice. You, you're willing to do it. Look how many people go off to wars or go off and do their jobs and you know it's just something we do so I did and my job's over I was kind of glad you know then I read in the newspaper that it's with deep regrets that the grand jury has fallen far short of its duty they held in their hands the great opportunity to correct wrong for our environment I thought wait a minute that's not right we didn't do that we did our duty and they're the ones that sealed it and I told you about the settlement fine Rockwell agreed to the settlement and so then some, uh, there was a major story came out in Westward newspaper. And boy, that turned the heat up. We were under investigation. Now, I don't know who did that. The same, same group. It had to have come from one of the 23 other prosecutors because those were the only ones that knew that kind of material. So then we're under investigation. The, this, is, this is with regard to what had actually gone on. Yes, the there was, there was, that was released to Westward. Yes, right? yes, ma'am. There was, it was talked about indictments released to Westward, and now, and we're saying that now because this has been out there in the public, it's public knowledge, so we're repeating what has already been said in the newspapers. And, you know, the Justice Department would like to, nobody to ever say anything, but they've lied about it. You know, uh, Mike Norton in the newspaper. Right after that, and we so we went went public and started doing some things. Said we're under investigation for upholding our duty. Here we we're the only legal ones out there, and we're the ones getting charged. So Mike Norton said in the papers, you know, the, well the grand jury just never had the vicarious experience of participating in the indictment process. Well, in the book, and I read that to you last night, told you the story about how we did. We participated in it. We did our own indictments, and we refused to sign his. Can you talk a little bit about that, since uh, mm -hmm. uh, people might not know about the indictments that you all did? Right. Well, just at the that yeah, the judge's instruction said that after deliberations, the grand jury, if they haven't been presented to them, they shall draw up their own grand jury, their own indictments and present it to the prosecutors, and uh, they shall sign them. And you were told that initially? When you yes, that was in August of 89. That's part of these instructions. And, you know, I'd actually throwed my instructions away and had to dig them up. Somebody brought me another copy. Well, as I was lost, long towards the last, this thing was falling apart on us. I thought, man, how? what am I supposed to do? So somebody said, well, maybe we ought to look at instructions. Somebody much wiser than I. So we draw the instructions back out. So then we uh, and we were to do our findings in open court, and the courtroom was sealed. But we did do our own indictments. Now, if, if I can divert here and tell another little story about being the only legal guy. A year ago last Christmas, I was coming home from Lamar in my old pickup. You've seen us sitting out there. Same one. And <clears throat> it's a, a dark, a little after dark, about 5.15, sun sets at 4.30 in that area. About the shortest day of the year. And there's a line of tr trucks that are terrible on Highway 287. That's the main Fort Worth, uh, Dallas, Denver Highway. Trucks was terrible at that time. Two-lane road. 
And I'm doing about 62, 65 mile an hour, just fast as I dare drive in that old thing. And traffic trucks are passing me right and left, meeting trucks. And here this car comes whipping around all these trucks, and comes up right in behind me, and then turns those lights on. It's a patrolman, pulls me over. And he said, you know, I just pulled you over to tell you the traffic's piling up behind you. And I said, you know, it's very kind of you. I'm the only guy out here doing the speed limit. <laughs> he said, well, that's probably true. <laughs> and he said, no. I said, well, that's okay. Yeah. And uh, he, of course, he's shining his light in the back of my pickup, you know, looking over. And he wants to see my uh, driver's license and takes it and checks it out. Traffic's just going by. And we're sitting on this busy road, traffic. And that's, that's okay. He wants to see my restoration. I get the restoration, and I realize my restoration had expired in October. I was running for state office, and... I've forgotten about it. So he takes it back, and it's 30 minutes later he brings it back. We've been here like 45 minutes. And he said, you know, I can't get this to come up current. And I said, well, I know that. That's because it expired in October. And he said, oh, it did? I said, yeah, it did. I said, I'm going to get it tomorrow. I just forgot. I was expecting a warning. He said, I'm going to have to give you a ticket. So he goes back, you know, and the traffic's going. He comes back, and he gives me a ticket. And he said, well, it's no big deal. I'm not too happy about this situation. He said, it's no big deal. Here's an envelope. It's only 57 bucks. Just put your $57 in the envelope. Doesn't hurt your driver's license. Doesn't hurt your insurance. $57, put an envelope and sign here. And I said, I'm not signing. I'm not sending $57 in, and I want to see your ID. Don't ask a highway patrol for his ID. He gets upset. <laughs> he was not happy, and he actually argued with me. I said, I've got a badge, you know, and I've got a car. And I said, I don't care. You can steal cars and buy badges. I want to see you. And he reached in his pocket and handed it to me. He had his card and his ID. So I looked at it, and he said, well, now you're going to sign. I said, I'm not signing that thing. Well, he said, you have to go to court. I said, I don't care. I'm not signing it. He said, well, I'll sign it. And refused. And I said, you do whatever you want with it. So he signed it, and I he signed it, refused his name, and, and I took it. I wanted to copy it. And so I appeared in court. And there's all these people with different violations, real honest judge. And a lady just in front of me, her driver's license expired. And they'd give her a ticket. Well, he said the uh, ticket will be, uh, what, parole, or, uh, what do they call it when you're on, on parole? Wavered or something. Wait. Probation. 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 So we'll, we'll probate the ticket uh, three months with no traffic violations. And, you know, then it's all cleared up. Pay the court costs, $17 on your way out. And he said, have you got a driver's license? He said, oh, yeah, I, I did. I have a driver's license. So my turn came out. He said, Mr. Kelly, what's the charges here? And I said, you're charged with violation. I said, that's right, Your Honor. He said, if you have a chance to get tags? And I said, I did the very next day. I went and got uh, tags on my pickup. And here's, he said, you have the ticket? And I said, yes, sir, here's a ticket that I did, refused to sign. The officer signed it, refused. Okay. Well, he says, uh, we'll uh, waiver the, the fine. Fifty-seven dollars. It'll be seventeen dollars court cost. You just pay on your way out. It's three months probation, and then it's gone. I said no. <laughs> he said, "What?" <laughs> so I said, "It's." He says, "It's only a violation. It's an infraction. It's not a fine. It says nothing on your insurance or nothing on your driver's license. It said it's just an infraction of the law. I never heard of anybody contest." I said, "Well, Your Honor, I was. I shouldn't have been stopped, and I didn't appreciate being stopped, and so I want to go to court on it." Well, he said, we can't go to court because you can't have a jury on the infraction, but we sure have a hearing. I said, let's schedule a hearing. I don't care. Okay, so we scheduled a hearing. I went back. And now the arresting officer, I said, does the arresting officer have to be there? And the judge said, yeah. I said, well, let's have it. So I go back, and I go in, and I visit with the judge a little. And we, and we talk, and then the arresting officer comes in, and so I visit with him. He don't want to talk. And I asked him how long he'd been there, a young guy, and, you know, right out of school. But he'd already had a career move up to Colorado Springs, and he had some boys. And, you know, we, we kind of visit. I can find out about him. The judge comes in, and he said, well, let's, let's hear your story, asked the officer. So the officer says he's going south of town, comes up on these line of trucks, doing 55, and passes them, seven trucks, two cars, and pulls me over. I was doing that. And he said, okay, can they tell your story? I said, same as his. I don't know how many trucks, but he looks like an honest man, so seven, I don't know. But I said, you know, I was doing, my speedometer said 60, 65, it kind of jumps, but, you know, seven trucks, if you can come within 10 mile an hour of this lead speed guy, you're just, you know. He said, well, why did you stop him? And the officer said, well, he was 
slowing up traffic. And I said, well, it's not a minimum speed limit. And I said, what's I supposed to do? And the cop said, well, you could have pulled over and let him go by. And I said, well, no, that's against the law. And the judge said, yeah, I got a ticket for that one time. <laughs> so then I knew I was in pretty good grounds. So the cop said, well, it's imp I intended on giving him a warning for impeding traffic. But then when I discovered his tags was expired, I gave him that. And he said, well, why did you uh, not want your, or wh why did you not accept the ticket? And I said, well, because I shouldn't have been stopped. He couldn't see my tags when he came up behind me. Shouldn't be stopped, and you have a right to travel down a highway unobstructed in a legal vehicle. And I said, and there's no limit. I said, now, if I was doing 20 mile an hour, probably there would have been reason or for safety, sake, because that's his job, is to protect the highway. But I'm the only guy out there doing a the speed limit. And the judge said, yeah, I noticed. Traffic's pretty bad, and it's fast on that road. And the cop said, yeah, it usually runs about 75. I said, well, I was doing 65. My vehicle's old. The judge, he said, you know, when you did this, I thought that was pretty frivolous, but said, you've raised a very interesting point of law and piqued this court's interest. And he said, and being the only legal man out there is a very good defense. <laughs> well, him and the cop talk about it, and then a little bit the judge said, well, it's decided in favor of the defendant, case dismissed. So I got off scot-free. And the cop stomped out, and when he stomps out, he said, I still think you were doing less than 50. Well, at this point, who cares? Now, an interesting side note is that in this book, but that sort of says the kind of person you are and how determined you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps. And I had to drive to Lamar, which is 90 miles, so I made two trips. And my buddies are all giving me a hard time. Of course, you know, they know me. They're kind of laughing about this. And I represented myself. I didn't have an attorney or anything. And <clears throat> But I really believe that we should stand up for our freedoms. Now, the other funny thing, too, Dorothy, is that, see, I could afford to argue over a $60, $80 ticket. Now, if I'd have been charged with $2,500 or it was a serious crime, I would have done some. Also, there's all kinds of rumors in our country about how that the cops have a bounty on DUIs. And, you know, there's a lot of things about drinking on the highways. And, you know, while we don't want to discuss the uh, validity or whether that's how that is, that's a fact, and the chances of you finding an old cowboy at 5 o'clock that is drinking a beer driving down the road in an old pickup. You know, he just got off work, he's hot. Those chances are pretty good. And if there's a true bounty out there. So my contention was that I shouldn't have been stopped. They were looking for something else. And, you know, there might have been a little profiling there. And I could stand up for my rights and I could afford it. Now, my buddies are saying, and in the book, again, Right here. It says that here this guy's never even had a traffic ticket. So my buddy said, we know why you went to so much trouble to find that <laughs> ticket. So I'm playing that up. But, you know, we, we have rights, and it's, it's easy to stand. This one's not been that easy to stand up for. But when you're down here, and, and, you know, I'm not saying let's just go to fighting about this stuff, but let's say, hey, you know, this is not right. This is America. And... We have a lot of freedom. Maybe there's reasons that some of these freedoms should be taken away, but I'm not convinced there is yet. We keep it, them. It sounds like um, you didn't originally have any particular knowledge about Rocky Flats or particular feeling one way or another about what what was what was made at Rocky Flats. No, I didn't. No, I I wasn't a red hot activist or had an axe to grind or anything. I think if I uh, if I had a feeling, I'd probably been more in favor. Uh -huh. I, th I, I actually would. But then when I when I hear all this, and it's okay to go out here and uh, paint your house, but you don't want to cover your lawn in it. You don't want to make it so nasty around your house when you get through painting it that it's not fit to live in. And that's the case we had. We we just didn't need to do that. We we didn't need to put them. Now I I understand that you're not at liberty to say what the testimony was right but is it would it be possible for you to to say i mean were there things that you heard in the testimony that were distressing to you in terms of uh your views of protecting the environment yes very much so and uh, is that an okay question yes to you? you sure is it, it was and it's not just that i just got off the phone just mm -hmm. when when you were out here and i was on the phone and this guy's telling me the story about a friend of his that flew over Rocky Flats with a camera, and he gave me infrared X chrome film. He took pictures and said, out there, at there, there's all kinds of holes dug. We don't know what's in them, but it's 
bad stuff, and you can see that. And uh, Joe was just telling me the stories. Now, these are stories. Joe was telling stories about at Los Alamos. They would take these tankers, dig a big trench, drive the truck into the trench. The guy would get out, and they covered it up, truck and tanker and everything. And we can hear stories. There's a highway patrolman that stopped trucks going from Rocky Flats to the Lowry bombing range with toxic substance slurry in the tanks, plutonium laced, dumping it in the holes, dumping it in the creek. And <clears throat> we don't have proof, but I don't need to go run down that proof because I believe it without it. And this book, everything was proven. You know, there are stories. And we didn't want to just repeat all the stories that we had heard. You can hear those stories. You know, that stories, the stories I told, you've heard the same things. Uh, maybe a different story, but they all got the same theme. And it's out there. A, a lady that did a lot of work out there at Rocky Flats, very dear friend of mine, said they talked about the Caustic Canyons. And that's where they just pile this stuff. They just literally pile it. And then uh, you've, you've heard the stories and seen it about the Pond Creek. You know, that's, a, that's a well documented in newspaper stories. And we didn't need to do it. That stuff's still out there. It lasts 24,000 years. There was a study done on the snow this winter. Probably just barely got enough to even do the study. But <laughs> study done, it was radioactive. You know, the contamination is there. And we're against making it a wildlife area and kids playing on it. Karen, uh, she, maybe she told you in her interview that she thinks pure speculation now. She thinks this is just to make it a little more friendly. If you get kids playing out there, then you don't see the harm. And I've, I've told this story, I remember in, uh, when I was teaching school. Science teacher had a rattlesnake in a cage. And then one day they brought in a kangaroo rat, put him in the cage. But boy, that kangaroo rat, when he got in that cage and seen that rattlesnake, he just covered his head and stood in the corner and shook, scared to death. Did that for a whole day, sit there, and just, but he didn't die from fright. Well, the second day he's kind of looking around, you know, moving a little here and there, and he gets by with that. And then the third day, why well, he's okay, he's kind of at home there. Well, by the fourth and fifth day, him and the snake's buddy, he just thinks that's the best roommate he ever had. He's jumping around on top of that snake, and you go in there and see him sitting on it, absolutely no regard. In the, the week, he's gone. The snake's got him. You know, that's the way we are. We get so complacent with something here that uh, Joe was telling about guys talk about sleeping with reactors. You know, they'd go to sleep up against the reactor. And yeah, well, so whenever you're 20 and 25 and you rub up against that thing, it doesn't hurt you. Two or three weeks later, why, well, you're feeling even better than you ever did. You know, you've done a little exercise. Well, then about 15 and 20 years later, and What's the most important thing in your life? You know, when you get sick to get well. That's uh, everything else becomes secondary. Everything you ever work for, yeah, I'm so fortunate to feel good. You know, I scare myself waking up every morning feeling so good. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm getting too old to feel as good. I might hurt myself one of these days. <laughs> but I still ride the horses. You know, I spend all day riding sometimes. And it's, it's just such a blessing to be outside, to enjoy the environment and to feel good while you're doing it. And to see someone suffer, you know, it just really hurts your heart. And a little kid, you know, when my little the grandkids, when they get a cold, I just want to cry for them because of course they get over it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's very important and we just don't want to do that. We don't want those contaminants spread. We don't want those kids to get sick. We don't want it out there. But, and I think it's just a familiarity. And it's okay to, to be familiar with, with dangerous things if you know what you're doing. You know, I'm very familiar with horses. And once in a while I suffer a little from it, but you can have a few accidents, but I like to think I know what I'm doing. Even, uh, what is Siegfried and Roy, that's a kind of a prime example. The guy that, well, Roy, the one that got hurt with the tigers out in Las Vegas. You know, it's a very dangerous thing to do, and sometimes you get caught at it. But can you imagine me or you going in there with them tigers? You know, just walking in, going petting them. Well, sure, we're used to playing with kittens. You know, we've got cats at home, just a little bigger. So that's what's going to happen to us. Going back a little bit to um, the feeling amongst the um, 
grandeurs. W what was that like, uh, kind of to meet day in and day out with these this same group of people? Did did you get testy with each other? Or? Oh yeah, I think just like any other, just something was said about there's been one or two of uh, the number of divorces that happened and some job changes and stuff. But you take any 23 people and you're going to have a certain percentage. And our percentages were just like it. I don't think you could say we got real close. Uh, there was there's relationships formed between individuals kind of the, I had a few that I liked better than others of course and we were the only grand jury in the uh, history of Colorado that had had two Christmas parties <laughs> we did first Christmas party we invited the judge and the prosecutors and the court clerk and some court reporters and did they come? no no they that's some court reporters come the first one we had we we got to be quite friendly with some of the court reporters but did you have much contact with the judge I mean, he was no, not no. sitting there through no, the testimony. No, the judge does, doesn't come in. Now, the witness comes in, or the one that they're even charging sometimes will come in and testify. Their attorney's not in there with them. He's outside the door. This is a, a locked door. Only in the grand jury room is the members present, which is 16 for a quorum, or to 23. And it takes 16 to hold session. But in order for any business to be done, like an indictment returned, it has to be 12 to vote for it, or more. So if 23 people's there, you gotta have 12. If 16's there, you gotta have 12, you know, whatever. You have to have 12 to pass an indictment, but 16 on up to do it. And probably the reason relationships weren't really formed too much is that we come in as individuals and we heard testimony, and then we discuss it. We were a fact-finding, investigative body, wide range of backgrounds. You know, just just like a random selection of the population. Mm -hmm. And I was from the extreme southeast corner. There was a lady from the extreme northwest corner. She lived exactly opposite of me. And then the same thing over in these corners. And then as you come in, well, then the more, the closer you got to Denver, the higher the concentration. There was, of course, mo several more people on the grand jury right from Denver than there was from anywhere else. But there's a lot more people in Colorado to live in Denver than anywhere else. So that's the same representation. And we, we heard this testimony, and there was uh, two or three babies born. Got, and we all, always lobbied to have the baby named Rocky, but nobody did. And was, was some of the testimony distressing to you? Oh, sure. Uh -huh. Yes. Did you say that that was the general feeling amongst you? Oh, I think so, and some of it was probably more stressing this to others that wasn't so much to me. Uh -huh. Kind of depended on what your interest in your area expertise lied in, that the most uh, most was the uh, distress of what was going on. Yeah. You know, that Could you explain a little bit more about this Rule 6E? What, uh, what's that all about? Because people may not really understand. What well, Rule 6E, see, so you don't want a grand jury coming out and saying that we heard testimony and here's what this guy did. Because uh -huh. that could deframe so you. That would be kind of that's a hearsay. Yeah, yeah, and... Uh, you know, that's, that's what the evidence showed. But you haven't been convicted of any crime just because you're indicted. So you don't want a bad name put on that. Or you don't, and then, let's say it's a big drug case. And I walk out and say, you know, here's what this guy did. Well, this guy said, I could get a little upset about that. So he comes after me. So you don't want him coming after you. So that's for the secrecy rule. And then the prosecutors can be coming. And this was like I said, go back to the king. Grand jurors come out and said, well, they want to indict, but I'm not going to advise. So then they're mad at you. They could come against you. So the grand jury said this Rule 60, we will keep deliberations, testimony of the witness, and voting records so they don't know how you vote. We'll keep that secret from everybody. So in a sense, theoretically, it's to protect the grand jury. That's all it was for, was to protect. But here we have turned that around and where the prosecutors are trying to use Rule 6E to protect their illegal acts, the Department of Justice is using it to protect your illegal acts. Now, in the uh, New York Times article that came out a week ago, Dorothy, they had called a spokesperson for the Department of Justice, and he said he couldn't comment because of the secrecy rule. Well, let me assure you that it's not has no residual effect. So if I tell you anything that's a violation of Rule 6E, don't feel that now it covers you, because you can go out and say whatever you want. <laughs> Even the witness is not under that. The witness there, they testified, and they can go out and say whatever they they want about their testimony. It's 
just the grand jury. Just the grand and the prosecutors. And the too. The, the people, the U.S. attorneys, the people that are inside that room. The witness is not of that. Well, the witness, of course, goes out and talks to his, uh, her attorney, and they can share that information, too. So the uh, prosecutors, and they were in Washington, D.C., testifying. See, that's something else. The Whoopi Committee investigated. And they can... Can you say a little bit about the Whoopi? Yes, Congressman Howard Whoopi. We tried to get this before some congressional committees back there because we want to tell and so the uh, congressman whoopi's committee investigated this edith holloman was the lead person and bob roach they talked to the u.s attorneys and the fbi agent and that's when the fbi agent they forced him or tried to force him to lie to this congressional and they told all kinds of stories and then they would say well we can't answer that because of rule 6c that's covered well, how can we respond? Because here they're saying, well, the grand jury wouldn't do this. Some of that was just blatant lies they were saying. We weren't, couldn't respond under the threat of that. So we were under Rule 6E. And, you know, that was kind of funny when his spokesperson couldn't comment. But in the same sentence, he said, I can't comment on that. It's six rule. But I can tell you that there was not evidence to, to do that. And, you know, this thing's a joke now. These guys, and they're getting away with it. But we don't want them to get away with it. We don't think they should. What kind of response so far have you gotten to the book? Amazing. I can't believe it. And it's even well written. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. Oh, you should have seen the first drafts. I, I didn't even like them. You know, I would read that and think, oh, my goodness. Did you participate in a lot of the writing? Oh, yes, oh. yes, yes. Karen, Karen I, have you read this? I have read it. Okay, see, I, every, everything in there is in my, all the gray spots are taken directly from my journal. And then uh, we put the story together, and Karen did a tremendous job. And the first draft, and it's, it got a little difficult because you couldn't remember whether you were thinking about what you read or what you had read before. So it did, and when we got to this, this point, and a book, I guess, is a little like a painting or a sculpture or something. You never finish it. You just come to the point where you quit. So we come to the point where we we'd quit and got it published, and my wife had never read it, never read any. She's a librarian, and she had never read it. And she said, no, I don't want to read it until it's all done. And she read it and said, it's actually a good book to read. And the AP guy, Associated Press guy, read it, and he said he actually enjoyed it. That it read like a novel. So we're very pleased. We're getting lots of response. People are contacting the website. They're sending in their indictment. They're sending in their comment form. And, you know, I, uh, one lady said it was a miracle last night, Judy. It's a little embarrassing like that. There are some unique things that happen. And I would, uh, we get started on this. And I was telling you about, I think I missed a little bit of this. I was up to the five-year time that Karen started. See, I got through, and then, but every time I come to the point in my life, I'd say, well, I'm just kind of glad that's over. It's fun. Well, then here's something to come along, and I'd feel this little push, and this little light would appear, and say, you, you really need to go down there. So I'd do that, and I'd get to that point, and uh, but, well, that's kind of silly to even have come this far, but I, just, I feel like I was supposed to, so I'm quite happy that I got to this point. And then there would be an event come, and I, think, I'm, I can't specifically point to any, but I'd say, boy, that would have been wonderful. You know, I just wish I'd have went a little quicker because I missed a golden opportunity. You know, it would have been perfect timing, but I wasn't ready. So, uh, and this, this is getting old. Time's going on, and... Well, maybe it's time to quit. And so I'd just quite happily think, well, I'm kind of back to normal. And here'd be this little light and a little push. And we come, and I think it's perfect. I don't think it could have come at a better time. It was meant to. And all that time that I, and I worked with other writers before Karen. Oh, did you? Oh, yes, yes. And, you know, everybody come up and say, oh, it's a story. Let's do the story. It's a movie. Let's, let's do the movie. Story. I met with Ted Turner. You wouldn't believe some of these people I met with while we went through. That was a story. That's another story all in itself. Great fun. But so, we, so between 92 and now, or before you started working with Karen, mm -hmm. you had kind of looked around for... Oh, yes, and people would come up. And once that I was actually going out and doing something, they would come up and say, you know, I'm a, I've got this, and would you be interested? And of course. And I never got any money from it. But, you know, it was a story that needed to be told, so, and I would do it. And then we would miss the opportunity would come. But 
I now know that as each one of those people come into my life, I got better at telling the story. Because the first few times I told it, it was so involved in detail that, you know, I mean, this was gone by the time I, oh, wow, that must be really a unique story. <laughs> and it had to have some unique talents on the other side because without a legal background, without the technical training I had, it wouldn't have worked. I mean, you, you had to have some scientific background. Not, you know, I don't have much, but enough to, to kind of get through. Well, Karen had the legal, because without the legal material, legal background, you couldn't. And I, the person before Karen was a, a, actually could write, was a good writer. Some of the people didn't have the capabilities, but, you know, I was getting better. By the time I got to the one before Karen, she could write, and we did many meetings, and it was on the right track. She did a good line. But the legal aspect was a little weak, I think. And she told me, she said, you know, we really need to go to Washington. We need to interview Edith Holloman. We need to interview Howard Whoopi. We need to do these interviews. And I don't have time. She had a, uh, she was a young mother. She had just had a baby. Kind of a local girl. She had a lot of financial resources, but she wasn't willing to spend the time away from that. She did a lot of work for nothing. And uh, she said that it just has gotten a little beyond what she was able to do. But by the time I got through with that, I was pretty well prepared to really do something and knew where to go. And then Karen came up, and she had the legal background, and she had the ability and financial ability. It seemed like she didn't have to, to devote. She could devote the time, which was a huge, huge commitment. Can you explain a little bit how you and Karen met? Well, uh, it's actually, she was interested in my mule, I think, because uh, I'd ride the mule around the district campaigning for Congress in 96, and there was newspaper stories. And she had a group, Concerned Citizens for Nuclear Safety. And that... Uh, that's in Santa Fe. Yes, right? in Santa Fe. But there was the Associated Press had read some stories, and they had read about me and my involvement in Rocky Flats. So some of the nuclear workers at Los Alamos. Now, 96, Rocky Flats is closed. But they're starting to do the Rocky Flats process in Los Alamos. And here's these old guys, my age, mid-50s, career men, very intelligent, they're not liking it. They see what's happening. And well, maybe things haven't been exactly right, but there's nothing like this, and they're mad. And if they say anything, they get fired.